morning. Happy Sabbath. Uh, to begin, I kind of wanted to uh, play a video uh, just to, so it has a message and I just want us to hear this and then we'll continue with our presentation today. We live in a world that's seeking a distraction, a diversion from the everyday activities of life. Reality seems broken to us and our lives lack depth. And we're all seeking something beyond ourselves. Some seek excitement, some seek adventure or thrills. But what is the need for this distraction? It is because we are burdened. We are burdened with boredom, with guilt, fear, doubt, poverty and hunger. We seek rest from these burdens and so we escape into any other world we can. Drugs, money, violence, crime, music, movies, games, anything to make us forget our present pain. But beneath the noise and clamor, a still, small voice. A voice that says, come, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. A still, small voice. Now this morning, we are going to be talking about a bit about communication. Um, it's probably, you may know, it's probably the single most used tool that we as uh, humans uh, use, right? We communicate through messages, through hand gestures, uh, through tears, and, and many different forms of communications uh, we use, and it's a way of, we kind of relate in a certain matter with this, with communication. And there's three aspects of communication, I'm sure you probably all know, right? You have the communicator, in other words, the speaker, the person who is speaking. We have the communication, which is the message, right? In other words, for message. And then you have the receiver, the person who is uh, receiving uh, the message, or in other words, the listener, right? The person who is listening to this message. But in this morning, I um, kind of want us to focus a bit on the side of the receiver and the listener, the person who is receiving the message. And I want us to turn, we go back again, to the book of uh, Deuteronomy. But this time we are going to read from verses 4 through 6. And the word of God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Now, here's a question for you guys. And it's actually a very open question. What was the first command given to in that text we just read? Hmm? Here. Here. It's the first command he gave. In other words, to listen, right? Listen to God. Again, he says, hear, O Israel, that the Lord our God is one. It's one Lord. And thou shalt love thy Lord, and sh thou shalt love the Lord with thy, uh, I'm sorry, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. So, Lord, the first command he's giving the people of Israel, this, and this message is to hear, right? Tell someone, listen to me, it's an action, right? You're telling them, right? So, I see we have a, we have a few parents here. And uh, how many times, I'll just ask this question, how many times have you found yourself when you, children, you command them or you tell them to do something, right? And you say, hey, uh, I don't know, don't run. Let's say, for example, right, the most, the most obvious one in the house, stop running, don't run. And uh, they run and they fall and they hurt themselves or something. What is the first kind of, and if you really think about it, it's a very unusual question, but what's the first question you tell them? 
why weren't you listening? <clears throat> Did you not listen to me? Right? So the question I have to you is, were they listening or were they not listening? Right? I mean, they heard you. Right? It's very interesting. They heard you. I'm, I'm sure if they were, you know, there's no physical incapability of, you know, listening. They heard you. But what kind of we expected from them listening to us, for those who are parents? What, 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 we, kinda, what we wanted when we tell our children, listen to us? What actually we're asking them? Obey. Hmm? What's the word? Obey. Obey. So here God is telling Israel, hear, O Israel, right? In this context, it's more talking about a close, a, a pay attention, right? An attentiveness. Listen to God, right? And what are you going to do? To love the Lord with all thy heart, all thy soul, with all thy might. So when I was looking up the uh, research in this topic, I, I kind of looked, I like looking at the concordance. You guys know the concordance or, you know, you can look up the, the Hebrew word that is in it or the Greek word, etc. I remember they told me long before my time that every, uh, every Christian had their Bible and a concordance in their hand, right? That's, that's was their, their, their two tools they went uh, everywhere with because they wanted to know, you know, what the meaning was there. So that word here, there in Deuteronomy, is Shema, right? Shema. That's the word that is used there for um, the word here, to pay close attention. But um, let us look up in our Bibles. We're going to look in... Exodus 19, verse 5. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, says God, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, what I find so interesting is that that word obey is also shema. Same word. So from God's perspective, the word shema, which is to listen, it also means what? To obey. Right? It's the same thing. It's in God's eyes, when you're listening to him, when he tells you to listen to me, he's telling you obey. Right? It's the same thing. They're similar in the same context. This is why um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the act of listening, going back to the children's story, you're, you're expecting an action, right? So you tell them, hey, don't run. You want them to listen to you, but you want them to what? The action is to stop running, right? So this is why uh, the psalmist here says, you see another example, he says, hear, O Lord, same word, Shema, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. So we see here the same combination. Hear me, God. What does the psalmist want God to do? To hear. But what does he want? What is the action is producing? To answer me. I mean, think about it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, not very complicated, but if you think about it, he's crying unto God. What point is him to cry unto God if he's not wanting God to answer, right? So it's, it's the same thing. It's, God, I'm, I hear me, answer me, right? There's an action involved with that. So this is why um, if we know that the act of listening and obeying is the, uh, is the same before God, then my question, I guess, to all who are Christians and who are following, trying to follow God, then how important it is to listen to God's voice. Right? I mean, I'm sure we don't have to go into a very detailed study of what happens when we disobey God, right? So if listening to God is the same as this, you know, um, listening to God is the same as obeying God, then um, how important it is for us to listen to God's voice, Right? So we uh, uh, found some things here very interesting in God's word that tells us um, 
what happens when we're not listening or the importance of listening to God's word. And the first one is found in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. And the word of God says, But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walking in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. But they hearken not, their, they hearken not nor incline their ears, but walk in the counsel of their imagination, of their evil heart. And they went backwards instead of forward. So we understand that in our Christian walk is a progression, right? We're walking every day, right? We're moving on forward. Every day we're walking, we're, you know, uh, how would I put it? We're, um, it's kind of like the stairs uh, to heaven, you can kind of say, so to speak, in that imagery. But it says when we don't listen to God's voice, instead of moving forward, what happens to us? We move backward, right? There's no progression. The progression stops immediately, and we start falling back. Uh, Prophets and Kings sheds a little bit more lights on this. Uh, the book Prophets and Kings, page 414, paragraph 3. It tells us a little bit more what's happening in this situation with Jeremiah when he was calling out the people of Israel. And it says, why, the Lord inquired, is the people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? Again, what is backsliding? Walking back. In the language of the prophet, it was because they had not obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and had refused to be corrected. So the way I want to set this imagery up a bit, it's kind of like a, like a mudslide, right? You ever seen a mudslide? Imagine like a mudslide going uphill, right? How much progression can you do going up the mudslide? Not very much, right? So it's like the more you keep trying to go up in your own counsel, in your own way, through your own efforts, you keep trying to go up, what happens to you eventually? Backslide, right? You slide back, and this is the imagery that the, the, the uh, prophet is using on them. They keep backsliding because they, what are they doing? They're refusing to be corrected. They're not listening to God's word. Okay? Now, another point that the, uh, the scripture points out, which I think is probably one of the most dangerous ones when we're not listening to God's word, is that our truth will perish. Again, Jeremiah 7, 26 and 28 tells us, Yet they hearken not unto me, nor inclined their ears, but hardened their neck, and they did worse than their fathers. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obey not the voice of the Lord, their God, nor receive correction. So again, we saw last time, let me just pause there a little bit. It said, what, was, what were they refusing to do when they didn't listen to God? They didn't want a correction. Look at the consequences of not listening to God, which leads to not receiving correction. Look what happens. Truth is perish, and it's cut off from their tongue. So whatever precious truth you thought you had at some point in your Christian walk, what's going to happen? It's going to perish, right? It's going to go away. Same sentiments found in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And it says, For the time will come where they would not do what? Endure sound doctrine. Again, they're not listening to God's word. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fable. Right? So God's truth will be turned into what? A book of stories. This is just some stories that the, the Hebrews made up and, you know, right? If God's word does not have a power to change, then what it becomes, right? And it's interesting. I think it's probably one of the most saddest things that we can probably witness in our lives when we, we see a brother who, or a sister who was firm in the faith and strong in there, and then at some point they leave the faith and they become Spirit inspiration tells us the worst critics of the faith to the point where they don't even believe the Bible anymore. So what happened to their truth? It 
perish. Right? It became a fable unto them. It's just it's another book of stories. Um, also, I just want to take a look here. If we can turn to, and actually I want us to turn in our Bibles to Mark. Mark chapter 7. You come with me and follow me in the Word of God. We can take a look here at another example, reiterating a bit more the point of what happens when we're not listening to God's voice and the importance that it is to listen to God's Word. We're not going to read the whole chapter, even though it gives us a better context of what's going on, but we'll start with verse 9. Let's start with verse 9. And, and we're going to read it, and then we'll come back and we'll uh, digest it a bit to find, you know, see what's going on. But it says here, And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Full will ye reject the commandment of God, that ye keep your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and who has a cursed father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift by whatsoever the mightiest be profited, by me he shall be free. Verse 12, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. And verse 13, this is the one we want to pay attention to, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So here is telling us that the background was going on here is that Jesus was with his disciples, and um, just a quick summary, they are there together, and they were eating without cleaning their hands, or something like that, right? Something they, they were not cleansed with their hands. And the uh, the Pharisees came up to him to, and the scribes to tempt them. Like, you know, look at your, you know, your people. Look at them. They're defiling themselves. And look at them. They're eating with dirty hands, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as a, as a major crime. So I eat with dirty hands all the time, but that's besides the point, right? But I, Jesus, instead of answering exactly what they were saying, he pointed out something that they were doing, which was much deeper. So the Zyre Rages tells us, I don't have the quote here, but the Zyre Rages tells us that what they were doing was they were making laws to guard you from keeping God's laws. You understand? So they were making up these laws, these rules, these extra rules, I like to call them, to help you keep God's law. And in turn, they made these extra rules more sacred than God's laws himself, right? So they had, them, they had these laws that they made, right? This is why he said, in your traditions, the traditions of men, right, rather than the commandments of God, right? So what happened? So in that same kind of everything's going on, they rejected God's commandments, right? Because they were following this rule instead of God's commandments, right? Rejecting God's commandments, not listening to his commandments, right? The same thing. And what happened then to the word of God because of that in consequence? It was made of none effect, right? So this is what's going on in the background. So this is why it's so important for us to understand that we need to always be adhering to God's word and to follow God's word. It's the only rock that we can stand on. Now, before I continue, before we can look at a few more examples, I had a very interesting question, and I just thought I would, I would bring it up because I thought it was... Uh, very interesting. Does, uh, does anyone know what ossicles are? Anyone ever heard that word, ossicles? No? So, I've heard the term. Some have, some have heard the term. Very interesting. So ossicles are the smallest bones in your body. The smallest, right? The small little, tiny little bones. Now, I guess maybe by the context of what we're studying today, where do we find these bones? And there are three, by the way. It's three little bones. Ears. Where do you find them? Ears. In your ears. Exactly. Yes, so these bones are found in the ears. And interesting, as I was putting this site together, I was researching and putting things uh, you know, in content perspective, 
You know, the, the ears are one of probably the most amazing body parts in, in, in the human body. And, and uh, I just digged up like three just, you know, beautiful facts about them. But the first thing is that ears, they never turn off. Your ears are always working, whether you're asleep, whether you're awake. Your ears are always working. They never turn off. You can go to sleep right now, your ears are on, and they're working. And they're, uh, they're very, very hard workers, I guess I'll say in that sense. And I thought another amazing uh, point was that they also self-clean. You guys knew that? Your ears clean themselves. So you know that wax that produces in your ear? That's your ear cleaning itself, which is very interesting. Now, don't go around and tell him, Brother Bell told me I don't have to clean my ears because uh, <laughs> they're already clean. But uh, yes, ears clean themselves. They have a, the mechanism when they produce a the wax is to clean themselves. But the most interesting part that I, I found when researching and looking up the ears and you know how God speaks to us and et cetera, is that they help keep us balanced. Yes, believe it or not, ears keep you balanced, right? Have you ever, I don't know if anyone here has ever experienced maybe some sort of dizziness or anything like that, Vertigo. vertigos. Um, if your ears are disoriented, if something happens to your ears, you will lose balance. This is why swimmers, there's something called, I believe it's uh, inner, inner ear barotrauma, I think it's what it's called, something like that, which means that if, a, if something happens, when a person is diving, they're swimming, if they experience this, they will get a vertical, a vertical, and they will drown. Because their up is down, their down is up, their left is right. They don't know which way they're going, right? So I just thought it was very interesting that where the tiniest little bones in the bodies are um, is where God, you know, physically God keeps us uh, in balance. And it goes again. Uh, with scripture, which I thought it was very interesting because the word of God tells us that um, God's voice is designed to keep us balanced. We look at Isaiah 30, 21, and it says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it when ye turn to the right and when ye turn to the left. If you look at this motion, right and left, what is, what is it describing? A balance, right? Staying balanced. God's voice is for us to what? To stay balanced, right? And um, I like the uh, it's a, uh, a text here in Manuscript 8, uh, 1900, which tells us that because God does not leave us to be in confusion, it says, man is not left to become the sport of Satan temptation. All heaven is actively engaged in the work of communicating light to the inhabitants of the world, that they may not be left in darkness of midnight without spiritual guidance. An eye that never slumbers or sleep is guarding the camp of Israel. Ten thousand ten times ten thousands and thousands of thousands of angels are ministering to the needs of the children of man. And what are they telling them? This is the way, walk ye in it, right? This balance. God's words, God's voice is a way to keep us balanced. If you look at James, what does James tell us when we're not balanced? What's, what's happened with a man who's double-minded, stuck between two opinions? What is going on? He loses what? His stability. James 1.8 tells us a double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. Right? So God's voice keeps us balanced, and we're not left to the distortions of the enemy. But um, I believe, as we're going to see in the next verses, that the, uh, um, the most important reason why we should uh, listen to God's voice, and I guess it's the most fearful one for every true believer, is that we cannot be called God's children if we don't listen to God's voice, which is obey, right? 
John 8, 47. He that is of God hears God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So this is, for me, personally in my life, this is the most fearful or fearsome uh, admonition that I should be listening to God's word, right? I should be listening to God's voice, right? Because we cannot be called children of God if we're not listening, right? Who are those that are saved? Those who keep his commandments, right? Right? Who are those who are his children? Those who do the will of my father, says Jesus. Right? So this is something that we have to keep very in mind. And it's very important for us to understand that if we are to be called children of the Most High, we have to listen to the Most High. Right? It's very simple. It's not, it's not rocket science like they like to say. Right? So in another context then, if it's important for us to listen to God's word, I would say, more often than not, how many times, kind of how we read it already in um, James, more often than not, how many times do we find ourselves listening to more than one voice? I think with almost every decision we make, we hear a second voice, or a third, or, you know, or so forth. It's not, we don't always just listen to one voice. There's different voices. So as a Christian, as a child of God, then how important it is for us to distinguish God's voice, right? I think it's very crucial, right, for us to know when God is speaking and when that is not from God, right? You know, Jesus tells us that what do his sheep do? His sheep hear his voice, and I know them, and they follow me, right? It says on that day there will be some that will say, Lord, Lord, and what would Jesus' response be? I knew you not. Right? Right? But his sheep, he knows them because they do what? They follow his voice. Again, it tells us, and when he put forth his own sheep, this is John 10, 4 and 5, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, and a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him. I know we can think of other verses that tell us about fleeing, right? For they know not the voice of strangers, right? So these are, this is God's people. His sheep do not follow strangers. His sheep knows his voice. Us as God's children, it is crucial for us to distinguish God's voice among many other voices that are out there. Now, I just kind of wanted to bring out a, uh, a point, I guess just to an illustration to, to bring this, I guess, in a, you know, I guess in our minds. But uh, I love breakfast. I don't know if anyone here, but I'm a breakfast kind of guy. Um, I love breakfast. It's, um, of course, not as my, this is not in my house. It's not as beautiful as you see it there. But I do, I, I'm a breakfast guy. I, I mean, I take breakfast over anything, lunch, you know, tofu, whatever, soup. <laughs> Anything out there, um, I will, you know, so I always, but the thing is, it's interesting, I was looking back, where did this come from, and I recall when I was young, my mother will always uh, wake up early and she'll make, that's the first thing she'll do, right after that, she'll make our breakfast, and um, if we ever try to skip out on breakfast, she will tell us, in Spanish, uh, siéntate ahí, ven a comer, which translates to sit down there and come and eat, right? And this she will say all the time. If you ever, like, you know how sometimes your kids, you're playing around, you forget to eat and stuff like that, and uh, she'll say, siéntate ahí, ven a comer. And just sit down here and, um, and come to eat. And I thought this was very interesting because I'm 35 years old. I don't live with my mother. It's been eons since I last lived with my mother. But guess what I hear every time I skip breakfast? What do I hear? Voice. My mother's voice. Jonathan, sit down and eat. 
And I was thinking, it's like, why, why, do, why do you hear that? And anyone here has, still can remember your parents' admonitions in a certain way? Why do you hear that? Well, and that's why I started putting together, is how is that voice so distinguishable to me and anybody else? I just, I hear my mother's voice. So looking up, the first thing I thought it was, well, the first thing is, it was said by her, right? It was her voice that was speaking to me, right? So this is why I know is my mom. When I hear those words, I know that's my mom's voice. Yes. So the Bible tells in 2 Timothy 3.16 what it tells about God's word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. So we know who is speaking to us in his word. Testimony, uh, volume five. I thought this text was very interesting. Uh, 393, paragraph two. The word of the living God is not merely written, but spoken. The Bible is God's voice speaking to us. Just as surely as thou we could hear it with our ears. If we will realize this, with what awe will we open up God's words and with the earnest we will search its precepts. So God's word, God's word, this here, not the paper, but the message here is God's voice, right? So this can help us distinguish, right? When something is from God and something is not. Again, Ministry of Healing, page 122, paragraph 3. It tells us, so with all the promises of God's word. In them, he is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as we could listen to his voice. Right? So God's word is his voice. Right? So another reason why... I was thinking back, I was like, why do I keep hearing my mom's voice when I'm skipping that breakfast? It was because it was repeated by her. Constantly, every morning, if I try to skip breakfast, (laughs) sit down, come and eat. And this constant repetition did something in my mind that now I hear it when she's not even there. Look what what God tells the children of Israel. in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. In these words, remember the words we were at the beginning, which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto the children, unto thy children, and thou shalt talk to them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou rises up. A constant what were they supposed to do with the children of Israel? Repetition. Repeating it over and over, over and over, in the morning, at night, by the wayside. Constantly speaking to them God's word, right? And I, I like some of the expressions that, I don't know if you guys heard the expressions, uh, um, when you do something a lot, it becomes second nature to you, right? You guys heard that expression? It becomes a second nature. Practice makes perfect. All these, and this is kind of what God is saying. The more we are acquainted with God's word, the more it becomes part of us, right? It becomes, you know, it, you know, God's word. We constantly hearing his word, we hear it. Great Controversy tells us, uh, 598, um, paragraph, this is one and two, part of one and two. It says, God has given up his word that we may become acquainted with his teaching and know for ourselves what he requires of us. So what he gave us his word for? That we may become what? Acquainted. Can you be acquainted with something that you just do occasionally? You know? No. Who are your acquaintances? Who are somebody you're acquainted with? Well, someone you frequently interact, right? That's what the word means in itself. And it says, continue saying, it's the first and highest duty of every rational being to learn from the scripture what is truth and then to walk in the light and encourage others to follow his example. We should... Day by day, study the Bible diligently. Here's the word again. Weighing every thought and comparing scripture with scripture with divine help, we are to form opinions for ourselves as we are to answer for ourselves before God. Right? So this is a constant thing, day by day, 
constantly, constantly looking up, reading scripture, and we get acquainted with it in such a way that we can distinguish this is God's word, right? Now, another reason why I was thinking again why my, you know, my mother's words were so distinguishable and I hear it all the time is that the manner or the way that she speaks, right? I can right now, if someone would tell me, I guess, your mom said this, I'd be like, I don't sound like something my mom would say, right? Like, you know, it's something, you know, sometimes you get that, right? I don't think that's something that person would say. So the manner and way people speak becomes very much, how would I put it, very, very much um, attached to their character. Right, the form, right? We all have personalities, right? So the way we speak is attached to each one of us. So the manner of speaking. And now look here, we can look at uh, 1 King chapter 19, 11, and 12. It tells us a little bit about how does God speak and which manner of tone the God speaks. And it says that he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not there, was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not there. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And then after the fire, what do we see? A still, small voice. There is a manner of way that God speaks that can help us distinguish him better. Um, I like the uh, comments, or sorry, the, the, not the comments, sorry, they're written on Steps to Christ. I believe a lot of us know this. It's right at the beginning of Steps to Christ. Uh, this is paragraph, I'm sorry, this is page 12, paragraph 1. And it tells the manner of our Savior, how does he speak? And it says, Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. He exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful kind of tension in his relationship with the people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censor human weakness. He spoke the truth, but how did he spoke the truth? In love. This is, this is the manner of speaking of our Savior. This is the God that we serve, right? And these are the things that um, even, it says, even when he denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered these scathing rebukes. This is our Lord. This is how God speaks to us. This is the tone of his voice, right? And we as his children should follow this example as well, right? You know? So I just thought it was very interesting how, you know, looking at these, at these few thoughts, um, to the point that, you know, sometimes, even the, uh, sometimes we, we can get in ourselves in, into a point where we think that, you know, when we hear all these voices, we think sometimes it's, it's our own conscience speaking, right? You guys heard of these things where people, you know, they're self-aware, these self-consciences and things like that. And, and these things, um, well, I believe it's not from God. Because, you know, if, if you can, how would I put it? If you can think of, if you ever, for us, at some point in your life, if you ever have done something wrong and you felt remorse for it, right? You feel something wrong for it. Is that not something that the Word of God has pointed out? Can you not trace that remorse to the Word of God? Absolutely, right? Any time that you have felt, oh, my guilty conscience, right? Something you feel like a remorse, your conscience and things like that, where do you trace that to? You can trace it back to God's Word, right? So much so that, you know, men talk a lot about conscience and thinking that that's all they need, but inspiration tells us that what is conscience itself? It's the voice of God. That conscience that we sometimes refer to, thinking that it's something in me that is, 
I'm doing something well. It's actually God's voice. God is tricking you. If you have done something wrong, his spirit is impressing upon your heart. What? That something is wrong. And this is why you feel that, oh, man, maybe I should have not done this. Maybe I should go back. Maybe I should. But it's God's voice. It says conscience is, this is on volume 5, Testimony to the Church, 120, paragraph 1. It says conscience is the voice of God. Heard amid the confliction of human passions when it resisted the spirit of God as grief. But what is conscience? Our own conscience. It's God's talking to us. It's his voice, right? And if we will be more acquainted with God's word, what would happen? We will realize that it was him talking to us the whole time, right? Jesus is the one speaking to us. And another thought that I, I thought it was very beautiful to add in here is that Revere and Herald, this is January 7, 1890, Christ is the author of all truth. Every brilliant conception, every thought of wisdom, every capacity and talent of man is the gift of Christ. He borrowed no new ideas from humanity, for he originated it all. Think about this. It's a very profound thought, right? Think about a person who achieved something great, right? They came up with a brilliant idea, something amazing, something wonderful, something wow. Do we think God in heaven is looking down like, wow, I never thought of that. That's something good. That's something good. I should have thought of that first. It doesn't make any sense, right? No. All good comes from God, right? God is the one who inspires man to do good, right? Our conscience, he talks so he impresses upon our spirit. So this is why I think in, it's very important for us, brothers and sisters, to distinguish God's word. And the more we are acquainted with his word, the more we will recognize that it's God, you know, God's voice speaking to us. Now, in conclusion... That's where we're a little bit out of time as well. We have uh, learned today that listening to God is actually what? Obeying God, right? This is what God means by listen to me, pay attention, hearken unto me, right? That's where you get the word hear, hearken is in there, right? We also understood that there's an importance, right? The importance of listening to God. What happens to us in our Christian walk if we're not listening to God's word, right? We won't progress. We'll move backwards, right? And then we also look at different ways that we can distinguish God's voice, right? By repetition, by studying his word, reading his word day by day. The more we are inclined to his word, the more readily we'll be able to, um, uh, to distinguish God's word. And then once we learn to distinguish God's word. Once we learn to listen, to obey, look what Peter, look at the promise that Peter uh, gives us here, or God wrote through Peter in 1 Peter 1, 22. It's saying, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. So there's a transformation that happens in us when we do what? When we listen to God's voice. When we obey God's truth, it, something in us starts to to change. We are purified in that sense. So this is why I believe it's very important for us, brothers and sisters, to, to listen to God's word, to listen to that still small voice that is still working with us um, today. And I believe that still small voice is still calling each and every one of us to his rest, which was the, uh, the beginning verse that we read that was in the video, right, which says, come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And brothers and sisters, if today we hear his voice, let us not harden our hearts. Amen.